Welcome to Real Estate 360 Live with Ryan Sloper, the trusted name in real estate radio. Now, here's Ryan Sloper. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Real Estate 360 Live. For those of you not familiar with the podcast, my guests and I will cover all things real estate, from interest rates to the economy, to what's happening in Washington. Anything that affects our real estate markets will be covered here. Um, many of you who've been listening over the, the last couple of years, um, when we were on CBS, and now we're found either on iTunes, which you can download, subscribe, share. Um, when you're on iTunes, you can search Real Estate 360. Uh, you can like download right to your iPhone, iPad, whatever it is you have. And if you want to just listen and stream to the Internet, you can also search at realestate360live.com. Also, any questions that you may have um, for future episodes, the topics that you'd like us to cover, you can ask a question on the right-hand side. Uh, there's an Ask a Question button. Just click on that, ask, yeah, ask the question, and we'd be glad to to cover any topics that may be um, pertinent to you, whether it's credit, whether it's trying to obtain a home loan, uh, just general real estate questions, uh, because obviously, you know, real estate is <laughs> a pretty complicated uh, matter at this point, um, but we'd be glad to help you out however we can. And joining me on our panel as he does each and every week is Louis Camerosano. Louis is a former school teacher, a former attorney, and a former general manager of a major real estate portal. He's often been cited in the media as a real estate industry expert, and the Boston Globe, Inman News, Wall Street Journal, Forbes, U.S. News, Fox Business, and, and many others. Lewis, how are you doing today? I'm doing grand, Ryan. How are you? I'm doing well, sir. So, um, you know, obviously last week we talked much about the Fed and their decision to pull back QE even further. This is just a continuation um, of, of their many pullbacks at this point, but it really means nothing to us. As we said, we've been reinvested, um, you know, monies back in as they're getting them. Um, so it's really a, a non-issue at this point. They have to kind of continue these strings of tapers um, because they have to, to continue the mantra that everything is headed in the right direction. Um, interesting, I wanted to kind of start this, this, this show with um, Bullard's comments. Um, <laughs> let me pull up. I, I don't want to... I've got my notes on him, too. Let's do it. Okay. So I, I, and I didn't want to misquote him, so I, I pulled up exactly... What he said here. So um, he's basically predicting. So this is St. Louis Fed. Um, James Bullard predicted that Central Bank will raise interest rates starting in the first quarter of 2015, which is much sooner than most of his colleagues think, as unemployment falls and inflation is quickening. Now, that kind of you know shook up things quite a bit because many people weren't exactly expecting the beginning of 2015. Um, and he also is quoted as saying, the Fed is closer to its goal than many people appreciate. Um, we're really pretty close to normal. Now, those two statements, <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm almost, you know, it's, we're completely moving in, in, in another direction. Now, it, it's, I'm actually kind of shocked. I guess I want to see what the rest of the Fed, Fed presidents come out and say because, um, I think we're the furthest thing from normal. Maybe the Fed's normal or the Fed's view of normal, but I don't think we're anywhere close to normal. Lewis, what's your take on, you know, those two statements in itself? The Fed is closer to its goal than many people appreciate, and right. we're really pretty close to normal. What's your take? Okay, well, Mr. Bullard isn't alone in this um, type of analysis amongst his Fed president peers. Uh, William Dudley, the president of the Federal Reserve Bank in New York, said uh, – you know, we still don't have an inflation problem. We can get the unemployment rate considerably lower. He says mid-2015 rate hike is reasonable. Bullard is even more rosy, as you mentioned. He says we're way ahead of schedule. Most data suggests the economy is getting stronger. Um, and I think there's a and, – and Janet Yellen calls the inflation data that we have recently noise. So they seem to be what, – what I, I – I don't quite understand – how they have this negative 2.9% GDP print, all signs of inflation accelerating, no signs of the job market picking up or anything picking up, for them to have this rosy outlook that the GDP will accelerate this year, they'll be able to start raising interest rates. You know, I, I kind of look at this as if it's the, the doctor knows the patient is 
is incurable and is on palliative care, and they're just talking nice talk because they know that the economy is not good, or they're just delusional doctors, and they actually believe they've made the right diagnosis, they've applied the right medicine, and somehow it's working when there's no indication whatsoever that it's working. I don't see where... You know, they can get the unemployment rate down. That's just a function of more people leaving the labor force. They can say they don't have inflation because they can always change the data. But yep. in your prime areas, Ryan, we've talked about this before, food, energy, health care, and housing, they're all up close to double digits. So they can say that if they want to toss in other items and remove and strip out the items that are important to people that they spend 60%, 70% of their household budget on, out and then say now we don't have any inflation. Uh, I don't I don't quite understand where this comes from. Now the two point nine percent negative GDP was a massive massive re um, revision to an already poor GDP, and somehow they have shrugged that off. You know, right. I, it's almost like the the Hillary Clinton comment. Well, that was. You know, she calls in from the poorhouse and she says, "Well, that was that was last quarter. Which difference does it make now?" Somehow right. they're not connected, that the economy came to a halting crash and we're going to blame it all on the weather. You know, call up Al Roker and say, what's going on? You know, is the, how's the weather improving? It, it makes absolutely no sense that they can somehow justify and write off a fluke, an anomaly, call it noise, whatever you will, a negative 2.9% GDP. And, Ryan, keep in mind, the way they calculate GDP today is different than they calculated a year or two ago. They added all types of uh, fluff to boost the GDP. So if you have a 2.9 negative in the first quarter, and remember – they were saying at the end of, in March that the economy had picked up in March. I don't know where they said that. I think they had a little thaw or something. So where is the data that shows that the second quarter, the third quarter, and the fourth quarter are somehow going to turn around and be better other than their own wishful thinking to justify this taper that they're doing? Yeah, and, you know, it, it's it's all hype. It's all a bunch of, uh, of crap, really. I mean, that's what it is. It's just talk. It means nothing other than they can keep continuing to convince the markets and Wall Street that everything is headed in the right direction. I mean, he's basically he's saying that inflation and unemployment will be at the levels that it should be by the end of the year. And if, if his forecast bear out, you're basically going to be at the right target on both dimensions, possibly later this year, exactly what he said. And he said that it was kind of shocking. He doesn't think that the markets and policymakers have really digested that that's where we're at. Well, because – that whatever you're talking about doesn't really add up. I mean, it, so, <laughs> Lewis, you would think, right, that if, if everything is really moving in the right direction, and the second quarter numbers for Walmart and Target and all these big stores, big corporations, should be outstanding, right? They shouldn't post negative numbers for the second quarter. No, correct? 68% of that GDP number is going to be consumer spending. Right, so they, we would we should expect that if everything's moving in the right direction, they, none of these companies should have negative numbers for the second quarter, because we don't have the we don't have the winter and the cold weather to blame this time. Right. So, um, if if we don't get record numbers this second quarter, then everything that they say to me means nothing. Because give me Ryan, give me one piece of data. I had a discussion, a quick it wasn't a discussion, but a back and forth on Twitter with a Time reporter, and he suggested and stated that the, the rest of the year the economy is going to pick up. And I said, you don't believe that weather nonsense, do you? And he wrote back and he says, well, how do you explain these positive initial jobless claim numbers? <laughs> and as you, as you and I know, Ryan, we talk about a week in and week out, I said the lower initial jobless claim numbers are a function of a smaller labor force. There's fewer people left to hire because fewer people were hired. There was less job growth over the last five years, a lot of people were fired. So there's just fewer people left to fire. So the fact that that's going down doesn't mean the labor market's improving. It just means that that number is going down, but it doesn't mean there's more people getting hired. So if he's holding, and, and there are a lot of people who look at that initial jobless claims number, they see it go down, and they claim that it's a sign not just of rising employment, which it isn't, it's just a sign of declining uh, initial jobless claims, but then they also say that it's a sign of an improving economy, housing market. They they extrapolate and project onto it so much positive news that doesn't exist. So, right. so that's his point of view, and he's not alone in that point of view. That no. because the initial jobless claim is closer to three hundred thousand, 
Therefore, the recovery is intact. And to just blow off the fact that, you know, we had low initial jobless claims numbers in January, February, March this year, and we still had a negative 2.9 GDP. And those numbers haven't improved much anyway. It's not like they went from 320 to 190 in the last uh, two months and say, well, that's a big difference between the first and second quarter. The initial jobless claims have been coming in all year around 310 to 320. So there hasn't been a dramatic improvement. And in the first quarter, if you're going to use the initial jobless claims as an indicator to GDP growth, didn't happen in the first quarter, and they right. haven't gotten better since. No. And you know what? I, we all, I often talk about um, the eye test, Lewis, right? And, and really, who cares what the initial weekly job, jobless claims are, right? Who cares what these numbers are? Because if you just look at the basic numbers of what companies are posting as far as profits and earnings and they're negative – that's an automatic indicator that they're not hiring people. They're, right, they're and the stock goes up, though, and that means they're using their cash to buy back their shares to push the stock price higher. They're not using yep. cash to invest in their business because there's no demand. Well, there's demand, but there's not the type of demand that would rationalize investing more in their business or hiring more people. So they use the money to buy shares, and that boosts Correct. the stock price. Correct. So you know what I really feel the reality is? The reality is is that James – Fuller didn't want to come out and say that we really, we really have major inflation issues. The reason why they're making this move to me to say the beginning of 2015 is because they know that the inflation has kicked in into overdrive at this point, and they absolutely have to start raising these interest rates as soon as possible because guess what? The inflation's out of control, and I think that they, they're not going to ever come out and say that. They're going to say that they're moving towards their target which basically means that we probably overshot that a big time, and they know it. They know it. So it's only a matter of time before they're forced to raise interest rates, not because they've hit the, you know, they haven't already hit their target, because they, they, they well exceeded that a long time ago. Right, uh, even by their own measure. The annual rate in the last two months, CPI, is over 2.1%. Right, and to keep, you know, to keep these interest rates low, even lower for an extended period of time, I mean, it's just going to put even more of a drag on the economy. Um, it's, they're, it's forcing their hand. The inflation is already there. Lewis, you and, I, you and I talk about this time and time again. It, if you strip out food and energy costs, of course the numbers are going to be skewed. But, you know, now the, these companies are having to, you know, reduce their package sizes and everything else to keep the cost the same. But eventually that doesn't work anymore. Then they have to reduce their package sizes and then charge more for it. So um, this has been taking place for some time. Um, I think that, you know, this is definitely a very telling indicator. I looked and I had really paid attention lately to what's taking place in the credit markets. And since, you know, these companies really aren't making any money, there was a good article um, that was uh, basically, it was on Zero Hedge, and the the title of the article was, My Credit Score is Terrible. I'm surprised it gave me so much credit. And it went into basically talk about banks and lenders have issued 3.7 million credit cards to so-called subprime borrowers during the first quarter of this year, which is a 39% jump from a year earlier in the most of 2008. Now, what's interesting is about one-third of all the credit cards that were issued in the first quarter were to subprime borrowers. Now, why would that be the case? The that's, reason the why side, that's where the market is. That's, and, and if, if, if one most third people of the market, are subprime nowadays. Yeah, and if one-third of the market is subprime, so essentially, that means that, okay, well, let's go ahead and strip out one-third of the people from the real estate market, right? So we only have two-thirds left to even, to even potentially talk to. And then I guarantee another third of them are not even in a position to buy. So the market's shrinking, and everybody is reaching. Lenders, banks, everybody is reaching. So they're saying, you know what, I guess at this point, we're not making any money, so now we have to start taking big, risky bets again. So right. they're lending. They're, they're issuing credit cards. Credit cards is an is a, is a easier play than lending a mortgage to a subprime borrower, right? Because you're not lending 250000 You might be lending $2,500 or, or $5,000. Mm-hmm. The average rate for these customers in the first quarter was 21.1%. Wow. Extrapolate that over to uh, car, subprime car loans, same thing, or student loans, all people who are not in the best position with the best credit to pay back, they may not be mortgages at two, dollars $300,000, but they're still significant credit card credit lines, ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollar $30,000 car loans, and forty, fifty thousand, sixty thousand, eighty thousand dollar $80,000 student loans. All of these loans are not in a position to get paid back. There's going to be a very high default rate, already is, on many of them. 
And it's well, only going to get worse if people don't make more money. And remember, a car is a depreciating asset. Credit card is spent on goods that are, you know, decline in value after you get them. So there's no investment there. The, the education is, is not really an investment either if you're not going to make the money back. So if in a car, a credit card, and a student loan, if you're not getting a return on the investment that you make in those or the money that you spend on them, chances are you won't be able to pay them back. At least with a house, there's some collateral. The value of the home can go down, it can go up, but there's at least something in good faith that you can pay it back because they can always take your house. What do you right. do? Give the diploma back? <laughs> Rip up the card and send it back? Or give them back the old car with the flat tires four years later? It's not the same. Well, and it's interesting because so for those of you out there wondering subprime borrowers, they're typically defined as people whose FICO score um, are below 660. So on a, on a basically the scale, the top end would be like 850, right? So 660 or lower. And these borrowers typically miss payments on, on, on you know, credit cards or whatever debt. They've maybe suffered foreclosure, filed for bankruptcy. They don't have a credit profile. These are the people that are typically listed as subprime borrowers. Because so, some of them already have outstanding debt that they can't pay back. That's why correct. their credit score is lower, so they can give them more debt. Yeah, this same article that was on Zero Hedge, they, so they gave an example. Stephanie Sonar said that her and her husband in Colorado sold their home for less than they owed on their mortgage in 2012, right? Mm -hmm. She's 42 years old, an emergency room nurse, said her credit score fell to about 650 following this process. So basically she short-sailed her home in 2012, so two years ago. Still, the couple has been receiving credit card offers, you know, one after the next after the next. She recently signed up for a Citigroup credit card with a credit limit of about 15000 Okay? She said she was surprised they would give her so much, and the credit card offers continue to come every week. Well, guess what? They are now thinking to themselves, well, it looks like they don't, you know, probably uh, have that big mortgage anymore. We might as well just start throwing some more money at them. And see. Mm -hmm. Right? That's exactly what it is. So now... She's going to be paying 21.1% or somewhere maybe above there on, on 15 grand because typically when, when they know that when people come out from a bad situation, they tend to get themselves right back into the same situation not too, too long in the, in, the, in the future from that point, right? I mean, Of course, because now they have liquidity, so to speak. They can buy stuff that they weren't able to buy, so they buy it on credit. Now, Lewis, could it be that the economy could get a temporary boost from giving – people that really shouldn't be getting credit. Sure. There's a, a little boost in spending based on juicing the, the markets by – it's just the same as printing money. That's exactly what happens. The credit card issuer doesn't have the money to give you. You go out and you create the dollars when you spend them. Yeah, and, and how many of these credit cards are actually doing um, employment verification? I guess, who knows? Probably very few. Right. So – so, like, that's, it's honestly crazy to think that somebody would lend somebody $15,000 and not even verify that they have a job, right? Mm -hmm. so, that's what they did 10, 15 years ago with homes. Right, and, 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 and it's, history is repeating itself right before our eyes. It's the same stuff that we came out. So we started with credit cards, Lewis. The next move is going to be mortgages. We're going to see the same thing. I've already seen credit right. scores are coming back down to the 580 again. This was stuff that, that all Congress and all these with the qualified presidential mortgages and everything that they were putting in as far as um, regulations and compliance that we needed to, to only lend to certain strong borrowers and increase down payments. Guess what? That's a load of crap, too, because when the, <laughs> banks stop, when the banks stop making money, they'll do whatever it takes, including lending money to people that are not worthy. Yep. Right? Hey, Ryan, you're making an interesting point about whatever it takes, and it seems that that's exactly what's happening with the United States and trying to, and the Fed, trying to hold on to this recovery story and trying to do whatever they can to boost the, the recovery. Look what happened at, um, with Bank Paribas and in Germany. Bank Paribas is getting fined $9 billion. Why? Because they dealt with Iran. Okay, now what's the big deal with dealing with Iran? Well, they're a sworn enemy, even though Iran is now going to help us in Iraq. But the real reason for doing that kind of stuff is the United States is in a position where they're trying to hold on to the concept that the world power, the dollar supreme, and they don't want anyone dealing with Iran if it's going to be they're a user of non-dollars. So they have the audacity to slap a $9 billion fine on an ally, the French, Bank Paribas, 
you heard the recent story with the German repatriation of gold. They had requested half of their gold back over a year ago that was being held at the Federal Reserve. Um, and the Fed said, no. Then they said, they said, well, wait, can we come see it? And they said, no. They said, but what we can do is we can send it back to you, at least half of what you asked for, over seven years. Well, a year later, they sent back less than 5%. And it wasn't even the same gold they had on deposit. It was recasted um, gold bars. Well, just two days ago or three days ago, if you saw this, Germany released a statement and they said, you know what, we, we don't want our gold back. That's okay. Well, there's never been a question of, of its security. We, we trust that the Americans are taking good care of it. Now, what do you think happened there? That sounds like a hostage video <laughs> <laughs> that was released. They were probably told to be quiet, shut up, because A, you're not getting it, and B, we're not really a big fan of you going around saying and trying to create this distrust again in the right. Federal Reserve that we don't have our gold. So they make a big public statement, which doesn't pass what you call the eye test, where all of a sudden, you know, the, the, the circumstantial evidence is, well, you didn't let us see it. You didn't let us come and look at it. You refused to send it to us. Then you said you'd send it to us. Then you said you sent it to us over seven years. And then you only sent a small amount, and it wasn't the gold that we had given you. And now we're okay with it? It seems like the United States is, is pressuring its allies, the French and the German, to get in line behind the dollar. And then look what happened um, you know, in Belgium. All those bonds being bought in the exact amount or more than the amount that the Fed has been tapering. And again, the Fed is doing this or somebody's doing it, and no one's asking questions. There's Absolutely. no possible way, Ryan, that we've talked about this, that the Fed can stop buying 60 to 90 percent of the bonds at the low, at the high prices that they're paying and the low interest rates that the bonds are paying, and somehow continue to have a low interest rate environment. Somebody's buying them out of Belgium, and no one's asking the questions. Well, and, and again, that go ahead. And not to mention that they have extreme confidence that these rates are going to stay low, right? So, well, how if the market isn't buying them? Well, how well, are they going to stay low if they're not buying them? They must be confident that they uh, know that there's a plan that they're forcing others to buy, right? There, Correct. It has, it, there's no other. There's no other explanation for it. No, and this no is other. all heavy-handed stuff with the Germans with their gold, with the French with Parabas, with the Fed. Hey, we keep interest rates low, and it's just going to happen. And the final one, Ryan, that's been troubling me is the IRS. Oh yeah. They have just basically said. We'll give it's just like with Germany. It's the same kind of thing. Okay, we'll give you the emails. Where are the emails? Oh, um, we don't have them. All right, well, can you get them to us? No. Why? Well, the hard drive crashed. Okay, well, give us the hard drive. No, no, we don't have that. That, that crashed. Uh, that got destroyed. Oh, okay, well, then give us the backup tapes. No, we got rid of those too. All right, well, then give us um, all the emails, the emails that came from Lois Lerner's things. No, those hard drives crashed too. I mean, is this type of stonewalling that we're yeah. seeing in every element, which to me is a is a sign of when someone is you know desperate to hold on to power, they do yeah. this type of heavy-handed um, activity where they either refuse to tell you anything, don't tell you anything, or threatened <laughs> to, to stop asking questions. Yeah. And to impose fines and so on. And, and that's where I think things are very troubling because it ties in also to what you mentioned at the top of the show with Bullard and the other Fed presidents talking about there's not a problem here. 2.9% GDP negative, not a problem. Inflation rising, that's just noise in the words of Janet Yellen. And then to come out and say everything is fine and, and things are going to be better and we're going to taper this thing, as you say, knowing that someone else is going to buy them. It's, it's just a way of trying to show that they're in charge, even though all the data indicates they're not. They don't right. have the goal to give to Germany. You know, a $9 billion fine with France, there's no point in doing business with the United States as a bank if you're going to have to pay $9 billion. Right. Right? And then yep. with the IRS, there's, there's not an excuse for that. You, well, you can't, I, I don't care whether the issue is, it's the same with Watergate. You say no one's harmed. Who cares? The fact is if you ask someone for something and then they flat out tell you, my dog ate it, yeah, and you're not I, getting it. Right. I Unbelievable. Mean, 
the morals of this country are just getting washed down the tubes. And I, so what happens the next time you or I get audited by the IRS, Lewis? Are, are we allowed to say that our hard drive crashed and we can't provide that documentation? What are they going to yeah. tell us? Well, well, Ryan, it's more likely that you or I are going to have a problem with oh, – we don't have a budget. We don't have an IT budget of $2 billion. Okay? Right. It's possible yep. – that you know you could lose stuff on your hard drive. Maybe it wasn't properly backed up. Maybe you're missing a slip of paper. That's inexcusable. <laughs> you're in a lot of trouble if you don't have that stuff. Oh yeah, that's what I'm saying. But it, 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 it's not good enough for us to just say that we lost it on our hard drive, right? They're going to say, well, if you lost it, unfortunately, you're going to have to pay the full tax bill, right? Right. So, so, but yet when it, when it, when it's reversed, just just like it is with the banks in a way that they're going to be continue to be bailed out now. Don't think that city, as I mentioned, is going to lend somebody fifteen thousand dollars. Okay, they're the first ones. They're they're going to be one of the major guys that would be bailed out if, if that credit card's not paid and they have some sort of run on the banks again. They, they're going to look this, and this is how they can draw things out all over again, Lewis. Because if they start lending out credit to people that don't deserve it, or you know, don't have jobs to pay pay their bills back. And they continue to do this. So instead of fifteen thousand, let's just say this same person, Stephanie, gets about another forty-five, fifty thousand dollars in credit cards over the next couple of years. That keeps her afloat for a couple of years, right? Just, they have no limit to the types of tricks they can play to keep extending credit and to keep this game going. Money printing, switching over to Europe, whatever it is. We have unlimited access to capital, which. Um, I think you and I underestimated for a little while. We felt like, you know, they were running out of creative ways. But they keep proving us wrong. And, uh, but we, we, do, we have seen, though, that the signs are starting to change. I mean, the inflation's really kicking in um, on all fronts here, the, you know, with, with, especially with all the implementation of Obamacare and everything else. The costs are going up. More and more talks of people saying they've got less and less discretionary cash um, which is only going to become more and more of a problem, which means that whose who's pockets is it going to hit? It's going to hit the, 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 these big corporations. They can continue to buy back their stock all they want. Their numbers right. are going to get worse quarter after quarter after quarter. Ryan, right? I know you're a big fan of the comment section on news stories. If you ever read on CNBC or any of the news stories, Bloomberg, when they release the economic data and they put this positive spin on it that – Proves the economy, the recovery is intact, inflation's under control, the economy's accelerating, first quarter's operation, whatever it is. If you read the comment section, they, they're oh, priceless. Yeah. They, 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 they basically take the other side of the, of the talk, and no one, no one challenges them because there's not people in a position to say, yes, my economy is good, is that good, that I'm going to endorse what's written above in, in the news media story. Most right. of the comments, 90% of them, are basically saying, this is a load of crap. This doesn't make any sense. This is not true. You guys are cheerleaders. Yeah, and who were, do you ever see the, the, you know, the, the reporter or the writer of that story comment back to them? No. No. They well, I thought they had the comment with the Time reporter, and he just wrote, we shall see. And when I, when I wrote back, he said, well, how do you explain the uh, – the great initial jobless claim numbers, and I said fewer people left to hire, and then that just shut them up, and, you know, we shall see. To him, that's the evidence that's been presented. We're supposed to accept that, at least as one of the pegs of the recovery. Same with right. rising stock prices. Why, yeah, well, are, and, and, why are stock prices going up? Well, it's because it's a sign of a great economy. That's how right. they, they explain it. No, companies are buying back their stock, and people are – are just continuing to jump in because the Fed is saying that everything's moving in the right direction, and they can only gamble in the equity market based upon what the Fed's saying and doing. Right. And, 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 and that's going to continue. And don't you dare buy gold or silver because they'll short sell that. You know the stories how they naked short sell a year's worth of production of silver or gold in three minutes. Right. In one trade in the middle of the night. Now, who does that unless you're doing it to drive the price lower? Because they don't want that canary in the coal mine coming out. Right, and you know all the um, uh, the bonds traders are coming out and saying that you know um, because right now the bond market's pretty bullish. I mean, mortgage interest rates have been going lower and lower, and everybody keeps saying, "I don't think they can go any lower." Well, yeah, but prices of but home prices are flattened, and home sales have not gone up, even though we can't blame the higher interest rates on the lower sales. 
There's lower yeah, but- sales irrespective of the lower interest rates because people are not in a position to buy the homes. Even if you reduce the, the, the credit requirements and lower the standards, people are still not in a position to buy a home. Well, yeah, and you know, Lewis, what I think is going to happen, much like I just said that these credit cards are starting to be thrown out there um, pretty pretty generously, I feel like the next round is for mortgages guidelines to loosen to the point where it's enough to get prices moving and an upward spike just temporarily again. So every- yeah, but it's and, and, diminishing and, returns. They're not going to get the real volume and the real price increases that they're trying to get. I, 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 yeah, and I agree with you there, but I don't think that they care about that. I just think that all they need are these temporary spikes so that right. they, can, they can latch on to those for the next year. You know what I mean? For the, until they can hatch the next scheme to yeah, say everything absolutely. is working. You only need – remember we talked about this. You only need one report, which pretty much sets you up for the entire year. Right. right? They need something they, in the in – the you know what they'll do with the GDP when it comes out in August for the second quarter? It'll be positive. Right. Yep. Barely positive, maybe 1%, maybe even 2%. But then they'll revise it downwards sometime in September or October. And by then, they've already managed to say, well – See, that first quarter was a fluke. Second yeah. quarter was better. By the time it gets revised down, they'll have something else to tout, or there'll be some other emergency that'll say is why they were they got caught unexpected as to why the economy retracted again. All they need for the second quarter is some type of initial, before revisions, positive print. You know, it's interesting because if Do you think have, they'll get it? Well, it, see, if we have negative, like let's say we had a, negative GDP number, right, Lewis? For the so, second quarter? Yeah, for the second quarter. Let's just, or let's just say that it was, it was negative, but not as negative as the first quarter, right? Don't spin it as it's still moving in the right direction. Things are getting better, and we expect... That was an third, overhang from the, from the first quarter. That's right. That's why it's still negative, but it's better than 2.9. Exactly, and guess what? They forget about that news that day, and they're already looking forward to the third quarter, right? Now... If it comes back and it's positive, guess what? There's a the story for the year. There's the story for the year. So, and, and this is this is how ridiculous it's, it really has gotten. Any negative news is forgotten about basically one hour after it's written, and we're the Hillary two. Clinton. It's in the past. What difference does it make now? It's only about the future, right? It's right. Only about the future, and, as and they control they, the future by telling you what's going to happen. Now, they've been I, such great forecasters. Yeah, now while I do agree that it's important to look forward to the future, you still have to pay attention to the past. And everything that's happened in the past has given us no reason to have an optimistic future, right? So where How can you, after a 2.9% negative GDP, where none of the things were, not, nothing was going in the right direction? Why does that turn around on a dime in April, May, and June? How is it that we have 50-plus million people on food stamps? That number is growing. Now we're lending money to people that don't deserve it for credit cards, right? And we're loosening mortgage guidelines, all with low interest rates, things that we wouldn't ordinarily do. That all tells me that... If the economy was doing well, you wouldn't need to do that. No, if the economy was doing well, we'd have 6 or 7%. We'd have these companies having record profits quarter after right. quarter after quarter. We're not seeing any of that. The only thing that we see is a, is a high price. Companies would be complaining about... Um not having enough qualified workers, they can't find people to do the job. They wouldn't be work- They wouldn't be hiring people part time if at all. It's um, you know, it, it's gotten to the point where um, you know, it, our only indicator, as uh, we we mentioned numerous times, is just okay, great, the stock market's high, we have a low interest rate environment, things must be be, be doing great right now, um, and you know. And, and, and I will say that there are certain areas of the country and there are certain sectors um, uh, of, of employment that are doing okay. Now, sure. there's anomalies to every market, as we talk about all the time, and that's true for real estate. Like, if you, if you go into Washington, D.C. right now and you're trying to find a house, there's 20 contracts on these homes, okay? Now, granted, the, <clears throat> the supply, there's not near as much of a supply because D.C. DC is a much smaller area to begin with, right? So... There's and it's also work. it's also a unique area in that it's the one area where government spending has not dropped, and there's still a lot of government jobs and government contracts. Right. So when we have these numbers that are are you know. Not and by the way, New York and San Francisco are also different because New York is San Fran- New York is Wall Street, where you know the money's there, and San Francisco is all the VC money that feeds Wall Street. So those areas, along with Washington, are going to do well. 
Well, you know what I found interesting? So I was watching a, a real estate show. I can't remember what it was. Um, one of those uh, real estate something in New York City where um, it's one of those a- agents. Uh, they, they follow around three agents in New York City. And mm-hmm. one, one of the agents was talking to a prospective seller. And he was saying, okay, you know, well, so what do you think your house would sell for? And the seller said, well, ah, I'm thinking $2 million. And he's like, well, you know that the highest thing in the building is, is probably around like 1.5, 1.6. His response says, yeah, well, people buy real estate in New York based upon the stock market, right? As if an appraisal or, as, or the number he was asking didn't really matter because it's the sentiment of what's taking place in people's stock portfolio. That, that is a bubble sentiment. Right? Exactly. That, and, and when, when people say things like that, they bought, bought into the fact that, hey, Look, and if his I, home does sell for $2 million, he's right, and it, it, it self-validates, and it continues it for a while until it crashes. It did sell for $2 million, by the way. There you go. So it, it, it's, you know... It, he's a genius. Right. You know, yeah. The laws of economics have been suspended. Um, you know, the comparables don't matter. Uh, and, there, and, and remember, Lewis, these are cash sales most of the time we're talking yeah. about, right? So there's no... You want to accept... All. Thin air valuations, the sky is beyond the limit. <laughs> you can go beyond the sky. Well, you know, in, 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 you know, in a normal world, I always tell people, like, what is a house worth? A house is worth what somebody else is willing to pay for it, right? Um, mm-hmm. not, well, that's true with any item. Exactly. And, and I think in the, in the lending world, see, for the longest time, everybody always said, well, a house is only worth what an appraisal shows the house is worth. And that's not true. Because that's for tax purposes. Exactly. It is. And, you know, if somebody's trying to borrow money from a bank, it's different because the bank is going to set what they feel like is fair right. value based upon an independent appraisal. But They'll deny a loan if they don't think the house is worth what the person who's applying for the mortgage wants to pay for it. it, it you're 100% right. And it's exactly when I see certain sales in a neighborhood that are anomalies. Like, let's say that a house has got every option. It's got, you know, coffered ceilings and crown moldings and pools and verandas and all these things that – all the other houses on the street doesn't have, and there's a buyer that wants to buy it, and it's a hundred thousand dollars difference in price. And if they really want it, and they have the cash, they can buy it at that high price. Right. Now, if you don't have a cash buyer and there's a lender involved, it's a little bit sticky because if the appraisal doesn't come in at the sales price, then the buyer is forced to, to come up with the difference between what the appraisal came in and the sales price. So, in many markets where there's not a lot of cash buyers, it, it's you know I think that it's it's there's a lot more downward pressure on prices because employment's not very good, right? And if employment's not very good, um, then there's not going to be near as much cash in there, and everybody's going to be dependent upon getting a loan, 100% right. finding things. And when you have that, the, I feel like those markets, and that's why D.C., New York, San Francisco are thriving, because that's where the cash is. Wherever the cash is, where the markets are going to move the best. And well, those the markets area, have, what, 50 60% cash buyers as opposed to the national average, which is around 30 40 which is still very high. And I'm I, sure they don't have a lot of first-time home buyers in those areas either. Oh, I know. And you see, they're, they're, the first-time home buyer programs, the ones that um, are looking at like 100% financing, uh, one in particular I think that we mentioned on the show before was uh, NASA Federal Credit Union, right? And all you have to do to be a part of this credit union is basically open up an account for five bucks. And uh, all of a sudden, you're a part of the National Federal Credit Union. They have a program, 100% financing up to 650,000, 5% down up to 850,000. Okay, that doesn't get you anything in Washington, in New York, or San Francisco. Right, but but when you, when you look at it, so what are the, the credit score requirements? I believe the credit score requirements are 720 plus. Right, so you still have to be a prime borrower in right. order to, to get those programs. They're You've not. You got a very small pool there. Now, I will tell you, Lewis, if I see that they all of a sudden make the move to where they have these same programs and it goes down to a 660 or 640 credit score, it's going to change the game a little bit. Because mm-hmm. I think because when they open up, and, and if you remember where they used to have all these down payment assistance programs, um, FHA did, where essentially you could have the seller uh, gift you the down payment, and they start getting creative with these things. That's when we'll see that temporary spike in prices throughout the country that I mentioned, which will, well, it, it's not going to be sustainable. It's probably not going to go on forever, but I think it'll be a temporary boost throughout the country enough to where it's, it's everybody's like, oh, look, 
housing is back again. Right, but that's right? a very minor, minor echo boom because you cannot repeat. There's just not enough cash out there, qualified people, job situation, to kind of produce the price increase and the sales increase that we had in 2004, five, and six. Yeah, and, and you know, I think that there. You know, and that's the real. Isn't isn't that the real issue that whatever they manage to squeeze out, it's it pales in comparison. New home sales. Yeah, they've been up. They're up the most in six years. But uh, six years ago was one of the lowest years on record, so it's not that big of a deal. Housing sales, existing home sales, up a bit, but not up compared to where they were seven, eight, ten years ago, and they were, they were up three times more than they are now. So the volume yeah. is really, really low. Absolutely. I, I mean, I, I agree with you. I think, you know, and like I said, it it's all depends on who you talk to. I mean, I know, obviously – you know, I'm in, a, I'm in a pretty hot market because I'm in the D.C. metro area. So, right. you know, I'm always looking at things. Uh, I, I take what's going on here locally, but then I can still look at the national perspective, and, and the numbers are typically skewed because of my market, right? My market is skewing these numbers because I'm on the high side and not the low, not the low end. Right. Um, but realistically, it's, it, there still is major effects that even, you know, uh, really uh, are important to – to my area, because not everybody in D.C. Metro has a lot of money, right? The, the, suburb, the suburbs, I mean, D.C. Metro is huge anyway. So all the suburbs and stuff are the ones, those areas that are on the outside are the ones that are typically having prices stagnate quite a bit, like that you're mentioning, Lewis. It's the ones that are right in the city that are very high, and as you get further away, um, even just 15, 20 minutes are mm-hmm. on, they're leveling off. You know what I mean? I'm not saying like an hour away. I'm literally just saying a little bit. But an hour away, they they're probably might even be flat or declined a bit. Well, but you know, it, what happens is, is when you get about an hour away, what I'm seeing is those prices are considered more reasonable, right? Uh-huh. They, they might be homes that are only like two hundred or 300000 Those markets are actually moving pretty steady. So I, there's such a price sensitivity to the market. I mean, if it's and I think what it really boils down to is what can you get a mortgage at is it, and, and how is that in comparison to what you would pay for rent? So right. it, 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 That should always be the case other than for people buying is. for investment. Exactly. exactly. So that's where I think that those markets in the 200s and 300s is really moving really strong outside of the city. Um, and that's mainly just because of, of the, these people realize what they would pay in rent. If they can have a cheaper mortgage, it makes complete sense to do that. Um, but, you know, all in all um, – I mean, it's just mind-boggling to me that we still have interest rates where they're at. Um, but the Fed is, like I said, they've got an extreme confidence that rates will still stay low regardless of how much they taper. And that's only because they know that they're they're pretty much either forcing somebody's hand to buy these or they've all had a, a, a meeting that basically said, hey, we're going to need your help. Um, and then in, in turn, if you give us help, we're going to give you help, right? Right. Well, that's it's how central help. banks work to keep the – it's like the mafia – where, you know, the five families sit down and realize it doesn't make sense to compete in many areas. It makes sense to cooperate. There's plenty of it for everyone, and that's how they get along. It doesn't do anyone good. Just like why Germany decided it wasn't worth fighting over their gold, the amount of money they can make through central bank manipulation is far greater than the amount of a few bars that they have in the Fed's uh, vault. Yeah, they want that back, but... If it causes a problem where it highlights that maybe the Fed doesn't have it and confidence is, is lost, then they all lose. Right. You know, you know so it, they, they, don't need, they don't need the aggravation from that. So that's why like, Germany comes out and says, we don't need the gold. No, everything's fine. We trust right. Americans, sure. Right. And, you know, it's, it's crazy because these banks, uh, you know, basically, they know that the Fed's going to backstop them. So no matter how bad they do, they're going to get bailed out. And then, you know what? They're going to make profits. And so what's going to happen is these same banks are they're going to end up being fined billions of dollars. But what did it really matter? You get fined two yeah, billion. You made you made twenty billion. What does right, it matter? It's bad business to have the German central bank fighting with the Fed central bank, just like with the five families. Those wars are are nonproductive. Yep. They're better off. You know, kissing and making up and saying everything is fine. Let's continue what we're doing. Right. Um, you know, I conf- to- you know, that's the whole thing. If uh, the, the entire financial system is based on confidence, if confidence yeah. is gone, then no one listens to them. Just like politicians, and, once and they right. lose their credibility, 
which is hard to do, but if they lose that credibility, then they're gone. So and if the it, Fed loses its credibility and its ability to manipulate the markets, then no one pays attention to it. Rates store, dollar collapses. They don't need that. No, no, one, no one benefits from that. Would Even people agree? that don't like the Fed don't benefit from that. Right. Would you agree? A systemic that collapse way? doesn't help anyone, really. The only way that they would uh, basically lose their credibility is if the stock market basically crashed. Would that be the only way? That's, that's one way if the stock market crashes. But the thing is, they regain their credibility by talking it back up and pumping a little liquidity back into the market. Then they regain the credibility, just like they did by tapering. There was a point now, you know, it was five years into QE. People were saying, wait a minute, you guys are not prudent stewards of the dollar. You're printing too much money and it isn't working. Well, they, they took that to heart and they said, no, you see, it is working and we're going to stop because we're prudent. Look at Europe. Now they're on negative interest rates. That was all coordinated to give credibility to both central banks. The Fed is credible because they're prudent now. They've drawn down the QE. It worked, so that's credibility. It's credibility for saying what they were going to do. They've stopped it, even though they're still doing it. And it gave Europe the credibility to go negative because they kind of have to, because look at the successes over at the Fed. So they didn't need this German gold repatriation story mucking that up. Right. That, would un that, would, that would undermine their whole... We're in control, and we know how to manipulate, and we, we can run these economies properly. Well, if you can't hold on to somebody's gold, who's going to trust you with anything? <laughs> no, seriously. I mean, if someone says, well, I'm trustworthy, I'm going to leave you my two kids and my, my 16,000 tons of gold. And when you right. come back, one kid is missing, and, <laughs> and the gold is gone. You, have, you really can't say, well, trust me with anything else. Your well, credibility has been destroyed. You know, the funny thing is, Lewis, you, that, that's, a, that's a funny statement there, but I'm almost convinced that the Fed can overcome almost anything and, and spin that somehow to be positive. You know what I mean? I mean, yeah. we, we have honestly reached the point of, like, I, I, mind-boggling some of the stuff that I read, right? I'm like, did he really just say that? Like, for, oh, look for, at the IRS thing. The guy says the hard drives crashed. They have no backup. Coincidentally, the six other – request to have those hard drives crash. Hard drive crash, if you know, Ryan, if my hard drive crashes here at this computer, yeah. there's no correlation between your hard drive crashing. Correct. It's different than if the server went down and wiped everything out, then everyone's affected. But no, six people's hard drives don't crash. No. Coincidentally, <laughs> no, they were, they were all dropped off of a plane somewhere and into the ground. Right? I mean, they don't just all disappear. And it's just like Buller say, we're really pretty close to normal. Yeah. Who's, who's normal? You know what I mean? Well, the numbers that they – well, they are. If you look at their numbers, the unemployment rate is down. It doesn't matter why it's down, and there's a reduction in the labor force participation. That doesn't matter. Inflation isn't really that high if you use their CPI number. Correct. So they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And that's exactly why they they would not like my eye test because my eye test oh. is up to the Brian, you you create the test, not an eye test, but an actual test, and then you score yourself. Right. And you give yourself high marks. You make a few mistakes just for credibility that you're not perfect. Yeah. <laughs> that's what they're doing. Yeah. And everybody else is looking at it and going, No, you you couldn't pass any test that we gave you. You're a moron. Right. <laughs> well no, but say hey, here's my report card. And the point is, they're in charge of the standards, they're in charge of the school, they're in charge of the accreditation, so they're passing with flying colors. Yep. That's very true. Uh, you know, I did want to touch base, Lewis, one stuff. Uh, we didn't give a credit to this for the last couple of weeks, and I did want to give a credit Let's tip. Do it. Um, so this uh, credit tip, obviously, is brought to you by the Credit Pros. Um, credit Pros is one of the companies that we use for a lot of our clients that have credit issues, um, and... So many borrowers that are trying to uh, obtain home loans, they have what are known as debt-to-income ratios, where as a percentage of their income, um, their debts, including their housing ratios, are too high, not proportionate. So many people co-sign on student loans. So like, let's say that you know, um, your kids, when they go off to college, if they do go to college, Lewis, that you're going to basically co-sign for a loan for them, right? So 
let's say that now your kids are now out of school, they've entered the job market, and now they're going to go apply for a loan, or they're going to apply for a loan. Um, but, or actually, let me take that back. Not them, but you. And you're now responsible because you're a co-signer for them, and you're going to. I've go added that for- onto my credit portfolio. Is what you're saying? Correct. You've now added that to your credit pro- portfolio because it's a debt that you co-signed for them, and you're still responsible. Well, mm-hmm. what the credit pros actually tell you, many people don't know this, is if you're a co bar on one of these type of loans um, and the loan is in repayment, you can potentially ask them to do what's called a co-signer release. Many people don't even know this, but with student loans, it does exist, and if removed from your report, it's a potentially where just the, just your kid could potentially, you know, I'm, I'm using you as an example, Lewis, but just your kid would be responsible and your, your, it could be removed from your credit profile. Um, so many lenders advertise uh, that a co-signer may be released from a private student loan after a certain number of consecutive timely payments and a credit check to determine if the borrower is eligible to repay their own loan. So okay. um, your kid would still have to be able to qualify uh, to be able to pay their student loan back in order for you to get that release. Right, but why that is important is because just imagine, Lewis, if you co-sign for your kid's loan and it's an eight hundred dollar a month payment, right? That would be a huge debt to income problem if you're going to buy another house and you already have another house and then you have an eight hundred dollar student loan payment. Right. There. So and a twelve hundred dollar insurance payment. Health correct. Care. Correct. <laughs> so I think that. Um, you know, this is, it's not going to, you know, help everybody. But like, once again, these credit... So how do, what's the rationale for getting that off there? What do you have to, what do you have to do to do that? And why do they give that to you? So typically what you have to do is you have to contact um, the, the lender of, of the student loan, right? So okay. it's Sally May or whoever it may be. Um, and find out what their criteria is for getting a co-signer release, meaning like if it, how many payments had to have been made on, t- on time before they would consider giving you that. Right. Now, do you do this, or do the credit pros do this for you? Well, if you want it done more quickly, I always suggest you just having the credit pros do it for you because they're going to know better, you know, better questions to ask and things to get things expedited, right? Because anytime you try to go about these things on your own, it typically is a, a much slower right. process. So I typically tell them just to go through the credit pros, and, and they'll find out for you if this is even a possibility, um, you know. And like I said, it's not going to typically help everybody, but for those out there, many parents who have co-signed for their student loans and their, their kids, um, you know, are, if they do have a job now and can, can't afford to be that main borrower to get yourself removed, I would do that. It's good to do it anyway because you don't need more debts on your credit report than you, than you have already. Um, so the, all you have to really do is you can call the credit pros. It's 800-1800-411-3050. Or you can just reach out to me. I'll glad, gladly put you in contact with them. Um, but once again, this is just another tip that I wasn't even aware of, Lewis. I wasn't That's aware a good that, one. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't aware that you could release yourself as a co-signer. Um, and obviously, every lender is going to have some different stipulations, but it is a possibility, and um, it, it can't hurt to ask and find out if it, is, if it is a possibility. And if not, what you would have to do to qualify for that. So I um, hope that was helpful. Um, guys, if you have any questions for us for future episodes, if it's in regards to credit, loans, real estate, please reach out to us at Real Estate 360 Live. And on the, the right-hand side, there's an Ask a Question button. Lewis, we're coming up on the end of the show here. I want to thank you again for coming on. Please let our, list, let our listeners know um, where they can contact you and uh, check out your weekly blog. Sure. You can reach me at smoggle.com, S-M-A-U-L-G-L-D. And every week we have one, two, and up to four blog posts on the economy, real estate, gold, silver, anything that affects your personal finances. And we also are on Twitter at Small Gold. So please check us out. Awesome. Thanks, Lewis. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you guys for tuning in. And until next week, take care.